So people always know rose hips because of the vitamin C content, right? It's, it's <laughs> an abundant source of vitamin C. It's one of the richest sources. And it absolutely is. One of the, the downsides to that is that vitamin C is somewhat sensitive to heat, right? And so the more we, we're already drying the rose hips, and so the potential, the vitamin C potential is dropped down a little bit from there. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I am thrilled to bring you this conversation about rose hips with herbalist Julie James. We cover so many reasons to fall in love with rose hips, as well as things like the pros and cons of different rose hip preparations. Also, we discuss a favorite topic of mine, which is rose hips for inflammation. For those of you who don't know Julie, she's the owner of Green Wisdom Herbs in Long Beach, California, a full service herb shop and school where she has cultivated an herbal community dedicated to improving access to healing plants and to reliable herbal information. She teaches classes in person and sometimes online, with her primary focus being her two-year herbal apprenticeship, through which she has sent hundreds of new herbalists into the world. Having spent over 30 years as an herbalist, she delights in sharing her love of plants by combining science and magic, awe and intellect, and by encouraging folks to get their hands dirty, bodies nourished, bellies filled, and minds blown. Welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. This is so fun. Oh, I'm ex- I'm just so excited to chat with you. I wish, you know, I wish this with everyone, but I'm feeling especially with you that we were, you know, sitting down together having a cup of tea, uh, yeah. but we will make do. I'm really excited to hear more from you and we might as well just dive into what got you started on this crazy herbal path. Um, so what got me started is um, I grew up in... Santa Barbara in um, Central California area. And um, I'm the last of seven kids. And uh, my mom was a single mom. My dad was uh, had multiple sclerosis. So, you know, mom shoved us out of the house as, as often as possible. And of course, lived in a, at a time and in a in a, a community where where she could do that, where she felt safe doing that. The very end of our street was the gully. And it was this this drainage ditch, but it had uh, fennel and uh, oats and eucalyptus trees and um, mustard and wild radish and all of these plants. And my sister knew the name of them and <laughs> would tell me how to, to eat them and, you know, taste them. And so that kind of that concept that that you could know the names of plants and that you could eat them um, just kind of started me on it. Um, yeah. And then later on, I was studying um, uh nutrition and studying, you know, biochemistry, because that seemed to be, you know, the best way to, to really learn about nutrition without, you know, the, the weird politics around it in the the eighties. And I, I end up, I was, I went up to Humboldt uh, with my partner and stumbled on the California school of herbal studies and took Mm -hmm. an herb class and was like, Oh, Oh, this is cool. This is so much better than what I was learning and um, switched over and uh and uh never looked back (laughs) i love that there's like kind of like these different pathways that came into your life because i think that's something i hear frequently it's like it's not like the one thing but it's like the plants were like getting your attention in this era of your life and that era of your life and then it you know you just kept like getting your attention until you know you acted on it and I also love the like the free range parenting and just you know, how yeah. that that era, there's a lot of benefits in that just being outside all the time and, and playing with plants. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. I wish I felt that safe with my, with my sons when, uh, when they were growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have no doubt that they must have been experiencing the plants all the same though. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And now you're in Southern California and mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about as I was getting ready for your call is I think you're the third person from Southern California to be on the show. And of those three people, you are the third person to talk about Rose. And <laughs> I mentioned that to my friend, Rebecca Altman, and she says, well, Rose is the best medicine for SoCal. That's what she said. Right. <laughs> it is because, I mean, right now it's going to be, you know, close to 90 degrees today. Mm. It's hot and dry. And, um, and, you know, we're just, and we live in Southern California. So we're constantly, you know, dealing with environmental influences and mm. uh, that, that just, you know, and, and myself personally just tend to be overheated. I just, mm. I'm always overheated. And so what better plant to cool you down than, than rose, right? Yeah, well, I was especially excited that you did choose Rose because <laughs> when I first started the podcast, that was actually one question that the people helping me set up the podcast, they were like, well, what's going to happen when people choose the same herb? And I said, that's going to be the best yes. because it's so cool to hear different perspectives on the same plant. It's not like, you know, there will never, you will have 20 herbalists talk about Rose, you'll have 20 different perspectives. And I think the more we hear those different perspectives and the more things spark our interest or just a different take on it, you know, comes to our lives. I love that. So I'm really excited to talk about roses with you. Yay. Yay. Well, where would you like to start? So, um, so we're talking about roses. Am I the only one to talk about the hips specifically? You are actually the, yeah. I think Rebecca talked about the hips. She did an lecturary a bit, but yeah, I yeah. think this will be the first rose hip yeah, centered. Yeah. So yeah. So I like the, the hips, you know, the, 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 actions, the taste, the chemistry, the, the hips are significantly different from the petals. And so many people just kind of focus on, on petals and use the hips like as a tea, rose hips tea is kind of a go-to, but I love this recipe that I shared with you um, specifically because, because of the, 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 the unique chemistry of rose hips. So people always know rose hips because of the vitamin C content, right? It's it's mm -hmm. an abundant source of vitamin C. It's one of the richest sources. And it absolutely is. One of the, the downsides to that is that vitamin C is somewhat um, sensitive to heat, right? And so the more we, we're already drying the rose hips. And so the, the potential, the vitamin C potential is dropped down a little bit from there, from the drying process. Um, and then if we're throwing into boiling water, we're going to lose more of the vitamin C um, possibility. Not completely. There still is some vitamin C if even if you're you're heating it, but you know, it's heat sensitive. So what I love about this recipe is we're not applying heat, right? That's mm -hmm. and it's easy. It's super easy. We're not applying heat and uh, and super delicious. So that's one of the things is that that by um, by making an electuary like this you're you are protecting heat sensitive compounds. But the other thing is that the chemistry of rose hips contains also some really important carotenoids. So we have these organic acids, primarily vitamin C. We have lots of flavonoid compounds, which you always see vitamin C and flavonoids together, right? And they're so both both so important for supporting tissue strength and health and elasticity, right? Throughout the body. And again, kind of looking at that chronic heat and inflammation of Southern California, right? We need <laughs> something to help the, the body kind of respond to that heat. And the best way to respond to heat is make the tissues more elastic, reduce those mm. inflammatory pathways, but also make the, the body and the tissues less responsive to inflammatory pathways. And so both flavonoids and vitamin C do that. But then there's a lot of carotenoids that are also in rose hips, and those carotenoids are not water soluble. So when you make a rose hips tea, one of the things that you're missing when you, you, when you drain off the mark is all of those really, really important carotenoids. Um, and so by ingesting the whole plant, um, I mean, this is the, the benefit of all whole plant medicine. When we're ingesting it all, whether we're doing a powder or an electuary, something like this, you don't have to worry about the solubility of specific constituents, right? Solubility is not an issue because we're ingesting the whole thing. So we're just able to get everything out of there and uh, 
and it's delicious. Um, and it's easy, right? It's an accessible recipe because uh, basically all you're doing is um, taking honey and rose hips and mixing them together. You couldn't have a, a more easy recipe. Um, I like to grind them first pretty finely and then leave some chunks because there's a, a chewiness right as they hydrate. That's what happens. So the rose hips is going to respond to honey has like about 15% water ish. And so they're going to rehydrate in the water in the, the honey. So they're going to soften and become kind of chewy and nubbly and very, very, very appealing. Um, uh, and then Rose hips also has pectin in it, and so pectin is going to thicken the honey. So you have the absorption of the of the water, and then you also have the release of pectin thickening up. So it goes, it makes a much thicker electuary than many other plants do. It's one of the <laughs> things that you do have to kind of be aware of when you're working with rose hips, is it's always going to thicken more than you think it's going to. Um, but you add them, uh, mix them together, let them sit for about a week and um, they will rehydrate. If you put too much, it makes it into a very, very thick, chewy um, consistency. But I really like taking that and um, spreading it onto a thin surface and making like fruit leather. It's basically mm. fruit leather. Mm. Slip, cut it up into little slices and, and you go with it. Oh, that's a nice variation there, Julie. So this is for the Rose Hips Electuary. And for anyone who wants to download your free recipe cards, you can get the exact recipe instructions. You can visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. So you have just shared like a ton of really important information that I just want to like revisit a bit because I think there's some when it comes to like the myths of rose hips or just some misunderstandings, you really hit on a lot of them that I think is really important. The first one you said, rose hips are known for their vitamin C, but they have so much more in them. And that is like, if I have a pet peeve about rose hips, that's my pet peeve because sometimes people reduce rose hips to vitamin C. And like you said, they, they actually lose a lot of vitamin C through different processes and they're just so much more. So much more. It's the so least sexy more. part of rose hips is yeah. the vitamin C content, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Still, you know, no, no worry. But absolutely, absolutely, it's yeah, the least sexy part. We need to get a quote of that, Julie. Uh, <laughs> so that's important. That was really interesting to me about the carotenoids and how they are not water soluble. I didn't know that. So thank you. That's an yeah. interesting tip there. And um, I also love to eat rose hips. I love what you said about solubility doesn't matter when we're ingesting the whole herb, whether it's rose hips or another herb. And um, I do that with rose hips as much as I can. I just love eating them. And your recipe is a fabulous way to do that. Like you said, no heat, we're getting benefits of honey. Plus it's like a really interesting, the end result is really interesting because it is different than other electuaries. Yeah, it is. It's so delicious too. Oh, it's wonderful. And so one of the things about being here in, in Southern California is roses, our native roses make hips and they're delicious, little tiny, delicate, delicious hips. Um, but most roses that are cultivated here, because we don't get much freeze time, rose hips are really low quality outside of native native roses because we just don't get enough cold for them to really ripen, right? Most fruits of the rosaceae family need a certain amount of cold time. Think peaches and plums and apples and cherries and all of that. Um, very few of those fruits grow really well in our region for that reason. And so, so often our rose hips just kind of, they end up getting that kind of sickly orange color. They mm. never get deep red and they never fully ripen. And so, you know, to a large extent, we're kind of reliant on dried rose hips here in Southern California. Well, so confessions of a lazy herbalist, me. Uh, I love <laughs> dried herbalists that have, are dried herbalists, <laughs> dried rose <laughs> hips that have been deseeded because that <sighs> makes them so easy. And I literally go through pounds of this a year, like three pounds of rose hips a year. And I love adding them to things like you can rehydrate them and eat them. And it's that whole plant medicine. And the other thing that you had talked about is rose hips for inflammation. And I think that is like the rose hips are underrated for inflammation. We always hear about turmeric. We often hear about nettle. 
rose hips, rose hips, rose hips. That, yeah. I want that to be part of the conversation because it, they are truly amazing. For real. And, you know, turmeric and nettle, those are great anti-inflammatories, but they're really heating and they're really drying. And for hot, dry bodies mm. like myself, they just don't work all that well. I need things that are cooling and juicy making and nettles and turmeric are not it. I love them and I use them, but my body responds much better uh, to things, the cooling um uh, anti-inflammatories like rose hips. And I think that's an area that people don't pay that much attention to is the cooling, nutritive, flavonoid and organic acid rich um, mm -hmm. anti-inflammatories. By the way, have you seen, there was a product that was on the market. Oh, this is like 20 years ago or something, but it was a, a, a rose hip extract and they did clinical studies on a rose hip extract for osteoarthritis of the knee and found mm. it to be really, really effective. Mm -hmm. And it's not the seeds, right? The seeds contain yeah, some fruit. essential fatty acids, some really important fatty acids, but those fatty acids don't regulate inflammation. It is the fruit that is responsible for that. So, and I have a lot of inflammation. I have a lot of knee, I, I, I'm arthritic and ugh, my poor body has, has had a lot of fun over my <laughs> life. Now I'm paying for it. So I go through a lot of rose hips also because I just, I, I think that they're a, a fabulous anti-inflammatory. Yeah. You have lots of reasons to welcome rose into your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 There has been some interesting studies, like you said, on the rose hips and inflammation, which I love looking at scientific studies because it help, can help us think about herbs in new ways. And then for people who need them, it can be a great way to just support what we see happening in our everyday lives. So I do share a lot of those. And I remember one, I think it's in possibly in Alchemy of Herbs that I had found that research and it called for 45 grams of rose hips. And I've had people contact me and be like, 45 grams, are you certain? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, 45 grams a day. But when you're actually eating the fruit, that's not that much. But, oh. you know, I'd like to dispel that idea that you're going to get like a tincture of rose hips and take three drops and then think like, that's it. Like your recipe is a great way to get a lot of rose hips in, you yeah. know, that rehydrating dried rose hips and eating them, eating them fresh, but getting that whole plant, like once you're eating the whole plant, 45 grams isn't that much. Yeah, it really isn't. Um, and it's so delicious. I mean, it's, it's, it's yummy, but like you, when you rehydrate them, you don't even have to. So sorry, I started like three different sentences there. <laughs> the downside to my recipe is of course the sugar, right? The sugar is an issue. And the, it's also the, the upside honey. is the sweet honey. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excuse to eat honey. <laughs> Have to, it's anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, and sugar is pro-inflammatory. So, you know, things are complex. But just rehydrating, like you were saying, just rehydrating roses, it's a dried fruit. You re rehydrate it, now it's a soft fruit and you can just eat them. So, you know, for people who think, oh gosh, this is a really nice recipe and I'd really love to do that, but I can't because of the sugar, totally get that just throw them into some hot water, let them sit overnight. I Second really quick recipe, rose hips yeah. and apple juice, bl uh, let them sit and then blend them together and you make jam. Mm. And it's just rose hips and apple juice. Oh, so lovely. Yeah. yeah. What about other, because um, I'm just imagining, you know, it's hot, it's dry, we're feeling hot and dry. You mentioned, you know, if we do a hot water infusion with rose hips, we aren't getting the carotenoids, we're decreasing vitamin C. But is that, do you still make tea with rose hips in some way? Oh, absolutely, I do. Sounds yeah. cooling. Um, it's so wonderful. I just made a, a lemongrass and ginger blend for my, my shop, which is it's lemongrass, ginger, rose hips, an orange mm. peel, and some uh, chrysanthemum, the yellow chrysanthemum, and some uh, calendula. So, so it has all this, you know, yellow, beautiful yellow, and then these bright little rose hip fruits in there. Um, they do. I do always feel like I'm missing something in a tea because I'm not ingesting the whole plants. And oftentimes I will go through a mark and I'll just pick out the rose hips and just eat them. Oh, I love it. Because they're <laughs> yummy. Um, yeah. but, uh, but I do tend to prefer using them as a, as a whole plant just mm -hmm. because I do feel like I'm missing so much when I use it as a tea. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have all these different options of ways to enjoy rose hips. Absolutely. 
another thing you'd mentioned is the pectin in rose hips and how it can help thicken things. And because of that, I often add rose hips to my syrups and as a part of the ingredient list, because when we make homemade syrups, especially if we're using honey and not boiling it down to a super, you know, thick concentrate in that way, our syrups can be a little bit more liquid than we're used to from like a store-bought thing. So yeah. that's my like little trick is to add rose hips to it. And then those pectins come out and help thicken the syrup a bit. Yeah. And who doesn't want rose hips in their syrup? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it gives it makes the, the elderberry syrup more complex in flavor, right? It has that, mm -hmm. that sour. It, it's a lovely combination there. And you can feel that kind of silkiness just in a regular rose hips tea, right? You can feel those pectins come out because the viscosity of the tea, it becomes this full bodied, dense, pectin rich tea. So that's so yeah. true. Yeah, it adds a great texture to the tea. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share about rose hips? How you like to work with them? Other ways you love them? Uh, so one of one of the things that I do like a, about them is um, the seeds, the the, the studies mm. that are. If you if you make a mistake and you buy a pound or five pounds of whole rose hips, not seeded, and you end up having those the the hair and the seeds and all of that in there. Um, one thing that I like to do is to make an infused oil of the whole rose hips fruit with the seeds. So <laughs> grinding them to a, 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 a powder, you need a strong grinder because those seeds are really, really strong. But um, grinding the whole fruit and seeds to a powder and then doing an oil infusion, whatever your favorite <laughs> oil is. A lot of people focus on rose hip seed oil as a, as a, uh, an important plant for skin health. And it is absolutely, it's also expensive. Um, and because it has a high amount of linoleic acid, it has a pretty short shelf life because those, you know, omega-6 rich fatty acids just tend to oxidize really quickly. So I like to do with the, the whole plant, grind it into a powder and infuse like jojoba oil with it. Then you're getting those fatty acids in there. You're also getting the carotenoids and the other chemistry that we don't know about because <laughs> we don't know all of the plant chemistry there. Um, but you're getting a whole plant rose hips infused oil and it's lovely for the face really, hmm. really lovely. I've never I've never done that I'm so when you buy commercial rose hip seed oil it's expeller press so they're like pressing the seeds and getting the, right. the you know the oils out of the seeds in that way so that's different than what you're suggesting but what you're suggesting sounds absolutely lovely so I would definitely want to try that yeah I, I only did it because I got by accident by, the whole yeah and, yeah and I will not take all the hairs out of there. And I, you know, it's just, Oh, we should, powder. yeah, we should talk about that. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you're harvesting your own rose hips, um, my suggestion is that for the most part, you keep them whole and dry them mm -hmm. whole, dry them carefully. Cause you know, they can, you, you know, maybe even you want to cut them open a little bit to help them dry, but yes, that it is very, very tedious to do any large amount of de-seeding, de-removing those hairs of the rose hips, which is why I was making the joke earlier about being a lazy herbalist, because like I don't have a week out of the year to <laughs> harvest rose hips, de-seed them for eight hours a day, uh, which is probably what I would need, you know, to get three pounds of it myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 When you can buy a pound of rose hips for, you know, 20 bucks for, for really good, you know, primo rose hips. Yeah. Yeah. Blessings on the herb farmers that grow and. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. And process them with machinery. Yeah. Yeah. With that, I do love to harvest rose hips whole. I'd love to taste them whole, you know, when I find them, um, like taste them fresh, I meant to say. And yeah. one trick is that you can put them in the freezer. And if you put them in the freezer and then while they're frozen, use a butter knife to cut them open and get the seeds out. That's, you know, a way to make that a little bit easier. And I will do that on occasion and then infuse them into honey, the fresh rose hips into honey. So that, you know, Ooh. creates this kind of syrupy yumminess that I absolutely love. Uh, but that is like a, you know, that is a, if you ever get a rose hip honey from me, you know that you're <laughs> so loved because that is a lot of work <laughs> so yeah there's some roses out there that have much you know thicker hips like rugosa roses they have like sometimes they're almost like plums they are just so amazing our native rose yeah. hips you know they're thin thin small things like you were saying yours are too so yeah 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 and i grow rugosa 
flower. I have this big bed of Ragosa roses. They do not set fruit. Hmm. They don't get hips from them. They get sad and then they're, they're, the, the, the little it goes dead. And it's like, there it goes again. And I hear so many great things about Rosa Rugosa hips, but uh, they don't yeah, like Southern California. it's just not quite their climate. I'm guessing you yeah. get some beautiful flowers from them, though. It's beautiful flowers. They're so yeah. lovely. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> and those happy, crinkly little leaves, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so if I have whole rose hips, I love that what you suggested, grinding them up into an oil infusion. I will. Use, those are what I'll use in making teas and syrups because you're going to strain them off. And so you do yeah. not, you can use them whole. I just want to mention that to folks. If you do have whole, whole hips, you don't have to de-seed them, but you do want to filter them off. So it, with your end product. Yeah. Filter very finely. Get all those little hairs out of there. Mm -hmm. The seeds are a bother. The hairs are the, the ones that really make me mad. Yeah. Yeah. They're a bit irritating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so many lovely ways to work with rose hips. I feel like, I feel kind of funny because mostly I'm like, you know, as much as you can harvest your own herbs, grow your own herbs, you know, if people are able to, some people they're just, that's just not their calling, but with rose hips, I'm like, yeah, yeah just order those. <laughs> 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 just not even, I don't even pretend. It's not, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get a couple local to you, taste them when you're on the trail. But if you're going to go through pounds a year, it's just more practical that way. Yeah, it really is. Well, Julie, I'd love to switch gears now and hear about what projects you're currently working on in the herbal world. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is um, that f for, for the last, gosh, four years, we've been doing a Monday morning class. And at first it was in person. And then um, I started to um, do it uh, as a Facebook Live so that people who weren't in Long Beach could join us on, on Monday mornings. And uh, so it got to be this, this really lovely thing. Just every Monday morning, we had people and people from all over. It was just amazing to see how many people would join us on Monday mornings. Um, then, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, it went just to uh, recordings and um, a combination of family things and uh, and just, you know, life. Um, I stopped doing the, the Monday morning classes a while back. And so we're starting those again. Mm -hmm. And I, I had done them on Facebook um, because I'm not good at technology. Technology confuses me. And, um, and but I understood the Facebook, the Facebook made it very, very easy to, um, to do things. And so I was able to do it on Facebook, but you know, there's layers of complexity around uh, social media and I wanted to increase access. So um, I took the very brave step for me, which is moving it over to YouTube because YouTube is more accessible to people. You don't have to you know, sign on. So we're gonna be starting up our Monday mornings again on our, our YouTube channel. Same thing, it'll just be, you know, classes, just, just a way of getting, connecting with people. Um, uh, and people who aren't aren't around us. So um, I'm really excited about that. I'm I'm surprised that I'm a little bit nervous about it, mm. which cracks me up because I've been doing this for so long. Um, <laughs> I was like super comfortable, but you know, it's been a minute since yeah, uh, yeah. since I've been in front of a, a video. So Aww. that'll be fine. I'll, I can do it anyway, if it, even if if I'm feeling a little heart fluttery. But uh, yeah. but yeah, I'm really excited about that. It'll just be so nice to be back with people and, and chatting to people. It's been really interesting how how much of a connection there still can be even through, I mean, we've all found this out, right? Over the last couple of years, um, you can really connect and build community even from far away. And, um, and the Monday morning classes are really what kind of, what made me get that, what made me understand it. So hmm. that's what I'm really excited about. Oh, I love that. I love that it's Monday morning too, because I have this like running joke with my friends. I call it like hashtag winning Monday. And I'm always like, you got to set the week off right. And like, you know, it sets the tone for the rest of the week. So you got to really like win Monday. And <laughs> if I can think of like a way to win Monday, it would be to go to class with Julie James. That would be a great way to win Monday. That so, was the thing. Like, yeah. Monday morning, wake up and <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Julie, I have the last question, and this is the question I'm asking everybody in season four. And the question is, 
what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you first started working with herbs? So what I want to share is what generally I tell people who come in and, and say, you know, what book should I, should I get? Um, of course, I always tell them the, the alchemy of herbs, but um, what, what, you know, what way should I start learning about it? What I wish I knew, what someone, I wish someone had told me and what I tell people is that just like we were talking about that there's so many different ways to work with rose hips, right? So many different ways to work with any single plant. There are so many different ways to be an herbalist, to mm. present as an herbalist, to ident to work as an herbalist. So, you know, it can be overwhelming, right? Um, moving into the herb, herb world and just seeing like, all of these, you know, beyond just, you know, do you, do you want to study Western herbalism or Ayurvedic or your indigenous ancestral uh, lines or Chinese or, you know, whatever, there's also, you know, do you want to garden or research or teach or forage or make things or are you, you know, working with them energetically or magically or flower essences? There's just so many things. So one of the first things is to take a minute before jumping in and going, yay, plants, I want to play with the plants. Think about what what is it that's drawing me to this? What do I want to get from this relationship? I'm starting this relationship with plants. What do I want out of this relationship? At this point, that's going to change, right? It always changes and that's fine. But being able to kind of narrow your focus down into, I'm really interested in learning how to cook with them, how to incorporate them into my food. Oh, awesome. Knowing that you can really narrow the possibilities down and say, okay, well, here's some great resources here. Here's some great plants to start working with, right? And all of a sudden it stops being overwhelming and it, it start, it's now, it's a path. It's a workable path. And now I, you know, you can go forward on that. And from that, you might decide, now I'm going to do wild plants and now I want to know the chemistry of them and now I want to grow them, right? Now you can just go off in all places. But that's what I wish someone had told me so that I wouldn't feel so overwhelmed is really take a moment before jumping in and decide what is it that is drawing to you? What do you want to learn? You know, prioritize those. Hmm. I love that. And it's kind of like when it comes to adult education, the thing that we get to do is follow that personal spark of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And like you said, and then it keeps evolving. Like one th question I have for myself a lot is, who am I going to be when I grow up as an herbalist? You know, <laughs> so because it <laughs> is ever changing. You know, I've gone from like selling salves at market to being a clinician to teaching to now, you know, podcasts and YouTube. I didn't see that coming. So <laughs> 20 years ago, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's always fun. There's always something to learn. There's always something to do. It's, it's, it's a delightful path. It's just yes. one of the best things. Yeah. And that's like you said, that inspiration, it's just, it's going to keep coming. You just, you choose the one thing, get started and then, then you're there for the ride as it keeps yeah. unfolding yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Julie. Thanks for sharing so much about rose hips and for your delicious recipe of the rose hips electuary. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor to, to, to be here with you. I really enjoyed it. It was so fun to talk with you. Aw, thanks, Julie. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Julie's Rose Hips Electuary Recipe. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also visit Julie directly at greenwisdomherbalstudies.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this lovely plant. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.